Happy Pride! And now there's glitter everywhere. Gay pride, or just pride as we in the LGBT community call it, is obviously very different in 2020, but it doesn't mean we have to stop celebrating. We've been fighting for our rights since long before the Stonewall Uprising in 1969, but that was a turning point for our community. The first Pride March, originally called the Gay Liberation March, was on the one year anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, and that was exactly 50 years ago. Obviously, like anyone, I'm sad, but understanding that we can't celebrate exactly 50 years of pride in a more community-oriented way. My boyfriend and I traveled to New York last year, and I was at the actual Stonewall Inn on the 50th anniversary of that uprising. I had plans for this year, but, you know, plans change. To celebrate pride instead, I'm doing mini rants about LGBT-themed films. As these are mini rants, they're more of reviews, so expect a lot of my personal opinions and biases. I'll be discussing some key elements to cinema, and gay cinema specifically. And as a union film worker, I'll be speaking to some of my own expertise. The elements are pre-production, what and what kind of efforts went into the planning stages of these films. This might be evidenced by the bonus features or just from the film itself. Production. How much effort did these people put into the filmmaking process? Post-production. This is big. <laughs> I'm covering things like editing and, above all, sound. There are a lot of indie LGBT films in my library and, well, yeah. Continuity. Um, I'm a script supervisor and I kind of look for this by default. Music. Yeah, this is separate from post-production because it's my show and I say so. Acting. Why did they get the actors for these roles? Nudity, because gay cinema is sort of um, notorious for its skin. LGBT representation in the key cast, because this is important. LGBT representation in the key crew, because this is arguably more important. So let's dive into our first genre, historical drama. I'll be looking at two films, Kill Your Darlings and Milk. I contemplated another film, which I'm not gonna say what, but I decided my personal opinions might lose me some subscribers, and these might be more important anyway. Okay, so, Kill Your Darlings. It's... well... Let me start off by making a confession. I have never seen any of the Harry Potter movies. I've never read any of the Harry Potter books. I've seen Daniel Radcliffe act in a couple of other roles, but this was actually the first time I saw him in a feature-length film as the lead character and his performance is one of the things that kept me watching. It is a very heavily fictionized version of the founders of the Beat Movement in the 1940s, and it's a coming-of-age story while coming to terms with lust and obsession. Radcliffe plays Allen Ginsberg, who was problematic, to say the least. Obviously, his use of sexually explicit language and shocking the world with his in-your-face depictions of homosexuality in his work is not the problem. The world needs this kind of kick in the ass from time to time. But he was a card-carrying member of NAMBLA. I mean, way to give the straights a reason to hate us, my dude. Obviously, this movie avoids any of his actual problematic work. This is a story of his days at Columbia University in 1943, where he met Lucian Carr, William Burroughs, and Jack Kerouac. He basically falls in lust with Carr, who is being stalked slash helped with schoolwork by Professor David Kramer, played by Michael C. Hall. Drool. It's not a love triangle, it's more of an obsessive one. David and Alan are both fixated on Lucian, who seems to have had a prior relationship with David, and pretty innocently consummates his relationship with Alan, who also starts helping him with his schoolwork. Unfortunately, this leads to a murder, and Alan is conflicted with whether or not to help his friend. So let's just get into the key elements. Pre-production. Apparently, Daniel Radcliffe had been cast in this role in an earlier version before it was shelved. Then, when the writer and director got funding, he stuck with his casting choice. So a bit of a troubled pre-pro, and this was the director's feature debut. And to date, only feature. Production. It's pretty standard. Clearly they had enough money to hire Radcliffe, so they had money for a real production. Without checking, I'd estimate the budget to be between five and ten million dollars. Probably on the lower end of that, unless they paid Radcliffe a ton. 
Post-production. There are some interesting editing choices in the opening and closing moments, but nothing overly memorable in a good or bad way. Continuity. Again, when you have a little bit of money, you have scripties that know what they're doing, so nothing major to point out. Music. Okay, so the reason I included this in my elements is because some gay films, especially indies, really drop the ball here and put horrible songs instead of even any kind of score. This movie has a score, pretty standard stuff with some classical music thrown in, but for whatever reason, they kept the tradition of really weird slash lame songs over a dramatic moment. Like most YouTubers, I like to avoid playing copyrighted music, so I'll just say it was during the murder scene. Not the montage, but the whole story of the murder. The music itself wasn't bad, and I really respect most of the director's choices with music, but the singing was not good. Acting. Like I said, Radcliffe had me from the start. The other actors are fine, Ben Foster is always good, Michael C. Hall is gorgeous in this, which kind of makes his character somewhat baffling. Uh, Dane Dehan, meh, I'll, I'll go with serviceable. And it was fun seeing David Cross in a non-comedic role. Nudity. Well, Daniel shows his ass a couple of times and gets in a very compromising position. It would have been hot as fuck had it not been part of a very disturbing montage. LGBT representation in the lead cast. None that I can tell, but uh, many are strong allies, especially Radcliffe, who is a supporter of the Trevor Project and recently stood up to newly discovered turf J.K. Rowling. Though I could have sworn she made some anti-trans comments in the past. LGBT representation of the key crew. And now here is some good representation. The director, John Krakaitis, who co-wrote the screenplay, and the other writer, Austin Bunn, both openly gay. In fact, I believe this was their passion project, so well done. I can't really call myself a fan of Allen Ginsberg, which may be some kind of heresy, but uh, yeah, I I'm not a fan of Death of the Author as a literary theory. And again, the man was a member of NAMBLA. Or really overly a fan of this movie. If I'm being honest, I probably bought it because I heard of a certain scene with Daniel Radcliffe. But it was obviously the work of a director who knew what he wanted to make, and the film itself is a good watch. Once. Harvey Milk was the first openly gay man to be elected to public office. Yes, the first gay person was a lesbian in Massachusetts, but this film isn't about her. This film chronicles his political career. We learn almost nothing of his life before he turns 40. That's right, this guy started his life over and made history at 40. By gay years, he's been dead for 10 years at this point. To sum up the plot, which as far as I can tell, mirrors history pretty damn closely, Harvey Milk is a gay man who surrounds himself with some incredible people who all step up to the plate to promote Harvey through at least three failed attempts to enter politics until he is elected in 1977 to a seat on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Here, he spearheads multiple historical wins for our community in San Francisco and the state of California. Unfortunately, another supervisor feels slighted and Harvey, along with a great ally for civil rights, Mayor George Moscone, are assassinated. And that's not a spoiler. Even if you somehow didn't know that he was assassinated, real news footage tells us in the first two minutes. So, as for my key elements. Pre-production. I mean, honestly, I could create a whole rant about this movie. Maybe I will. But to sum up, there were a few movies about Harvey Milk in the works, but this one had all the right people involved at the right time. It won an Academy Award for its screenplay, so <laughs> there was plenty of pre-pro. The director not only consulted those close to Milk and are portrayed in the film, but hundreds of photographs and news articles at the time to accurately recreate the time period. Production. Not only were real people and photographs used, but the actual apartment Milk lived in was used as his apartment in the film. What's more, the actual camera store where he started his political career was used as the set. This director cares about accuracy. I love that they show most of his losses, possibly all. Some movies may have skipped over this or maybe shown a loss, but it was an insane struggle to climb to where he got. The camera work starts out rough, intentionally so. That is not a detriment and in a manner typical for this director and smooths out as we go. There were probably more shots in focus than I was expecting. Post-production. I mean, I don't even need to touch on this. It was well done all around. No complaints, great stuff. Some typical avant-garde editing choices, which totally work. Continuity. A few minor things that I've already forgotten about, but again, this is typical for a director who likes to keep you in the moment. Music. 
Honestly, I loved it. When I heard a bit of the score on the Blu-ray menus, I thought it sounded like Thomas Newman, but the director's longtime collaborator, Danny Elfman, does an incredible job acting. You know, I'm surprised Penn won an Oscar for this. I felt he seemed to be trying too hard, to be honest. He definitely has some great scenes, but again, especially in earlier scenes, he almost is acting like he thinks gays act. It almost takes me out of it. But then you have James Franco in probably the greatest role I've seen him in, and Emile Hirsch, who just can't stop saying the word fuck, uh, but really pull me into the story. Honestly, it's almost great that Penn doesn't completely grab me, as that made me focus more on the supporting cast and even background, because really, even though this film is called Milk, it's not about him. It's about what he did to lift up the community. Nudity. James Franco gets naked in a pool, and either Diego Sands or Sean Penn, I think, show some skin in the dark if you, like, pause it at just the right moment. LGBT representation of the lead cast. Here, not too much. Plenty of gays in the supporting cast. Victor Garber and Dennis O'Hare, who ironically plays anti-gay state senator John Briggs. And, I mean, James Franco is probably omnisexual, never dressing his sexuality directly. I could have sworn that Emile Hirsch was openly bisexual, but that appears to have been just wishful thinking. Other than that, breeders. LGBT representation of the crew. So this is why the film works. It's clearly a queer voice. As I said, this film won a well-deserved Academy Award for its screenplay by Dustin Lance Black. Gus Van Sant gives us everything we wanted and needed for historical accuracy. Drama through a very queer lens. This is the kind of film we need more of. To wrap it up, we owe our very lives to advocates like Harvey Milk, to his cohorts like Cleve Jones and even Scott Smith. We owe it to his contemporaries like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, and so many more. And although they were leaders in our fight, we also owe it to every LGBT person and ally who marched and fought alongside them. We lifted them up so that they could lift us up. And that's community. As usual, thanks to my current Patreon, Craig A. Butler. I would love it if you'd consider being a Patreon. Like, share, subscribe if you're not already. And many thanks. Happy Pride!